uh, Schwartz, and so glad to have her join me. And a little bit about myself. I've been in Rochester for over 40 years and been in this uh, particular um, property for uh, over 30. And it was just a blank slate, but with lots of trees. They're pretty small, you know, when we first moved here, but they've gotten big. So I don't grow a lot of what I can preserve. Well, I, I, I preserve everything I can. I do buy a little bit, or if people have too many tomatoes, I'm just happy to take those. Um, so in the back, uh, you see right here, I have a teepee. I grew my cucumbers on that this last year. I think I'm gonna try some of my indeterminate tomatoes. Those are the ones that go on and on and on. Determinate tomatoes, stop um, at about four feet indeterminate go over six feet so i'm going to try those here on on that this year and i have a little bit of space on my driveway um, my neighbor is so kind to share some of this so actually i'm i'm a woodworker so i'm going to do a little uh, pyramid kind of obelisk right here and put i had tomatoes there last year to share with neighbors that walked by and this year I'm gonna do a strawberry tower. So I'm super excited about that. So I, I can uh, grow some things along my driveway, some tomatoes. And right here you see, I have a little space. So I might do some things on the boulevard, which if you do boulevard planting, you know, you need to get permit for that from the city. So we'll see what I can do with that space. The salts are always an issue. So I'll probably put in a container. I was raised on a dairy farm in Southeastern Minnesota, Spring Grove. And if you can see, let's see, how do I get rid of this bar down here? Oh, there we go. No, that's maybe not it. Okay, um, so I'm seeing something on my bottom, so I can't quite see, but this area over here, this must've been taken when we were really, really little um, from the guys that flew over on the airplane. But this whole thing was vegetable garden. So we did a lot of vegetable gardening. This is raspberries over here. We sold them in the grocery store. So we did a lot of raspberry preserves, a lot of raspberry jam to keep the farm family happy um, in our hundred. It was a hundred years old when we lived there. So yeah, anyway, that's a whole nother story. Um, so let's talk a little bit um, before we get started. If you wanna put in the chat and Christine um, will record this information for me, but who are you? Any teens out there? It'd be fun to see some kids interested in food preservation and growing, any elderly, any um, diversity. We want to reach every corner of our community and hope that um, through some of our presentations we do. Anyone outside of Olmstead County, I hope my niece Betsy from Colorado Springs has joined us. So make sure to say something Betsy in the chat if you're joining us uh, and uh, why you're interested. Maybe you've got a lot of produce every year and you wanna make sure to make that last through the season. Maybe you've been canning and you're, you just wanna um, make sure you're doing it right, like, like me. Maybe you wanna do some fermentation or uh, drying. Let's see what's behind here. Oh, or freezing. If you're interested in doing some freezing, we're gonna talk about all of that today. Um, so do we have, let's see, I'm, I've got, uh, oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, I want just me though. All right, I guess that's what I'm gonna get. All right. So, um, let's see, ask to mute, ask to mute. Close this, excuse me. Unmute, hide non-video participants. There we go, oh, non-video participants. Try, can everybody see just me or do we see it three or four people? Robin, can you just get it so it's just me on there if, um, so I can see my full screen? Okay, sure. Sorry, on. say that again. Um, I'm seeing four boxes underneath me instead of just me, and it's covering some of my screen. Can we just get my video so I know that I'm, I my mouth is moving, or I don't know why I even need it up there. I guess so people can see me talking yeah. and not see anybody else. Is that what's happening or what's happening on the screen? Um, I think it's individual for everyone's screen. They can have it set up how they would like. Okay. On it, I don't know. Let me let me play with it. I'll play with it while you're doing click it. Click the flat bar at the very top of that display. Okay. So I click that, and then I don't see anybody. But that's okay. If um... to, the, to the right of that flat bar, there's a box that that you can click on, yeah. and you'll see yourself. Thanks, Mary. I see that. So you're the one talking. I guess um, so. Um, now, if you mute yourself, I should see myself, but I don't. Okay, well, I'm not gonna worry about it too much. Um, but you can. Uh, now I see 125 live. 
pin, you can also pin yourself too. Click on, let me see if I can, it'll only pin to my screen. Okay. You can right click and pin yourself. All right, there we go. And then I'll go to that. Up, oh, then I'll go to that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so All much. Right. Sorry about that, you guys. Yeah. Okay, so if you've gone, gone ahead and plugged that in there, and Christine, um, just make a notation of that. So when I do my record keeping, I know who we are reaching. So the program mission of the University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardener program uses research based horticulture knowledge and practices to deliver educational outreach and project based efforts that inspire change and promote healthy people, communities, and planets. So that's our mission. And today we're gonna to be focusing on one of our seven areas, which is how we do things here in Minnesota. Uh, we have seven priority areas. And today we're gonna to talk about local food a little bit, and that's um, the, the feature of the focus of our presentation. So as I said, it's local food. And today is an overview of ways you can preserve your garden produce, keeping best practices and safety at the forefront. So what do you hope to preserve? Maybe you've got your piece of paper, maybe you print it off, excuse me, your uh, handout already, make some notes on there. What do you wanna preserve? Will you grow some or most of the great ingredients? What techniques are you hoping to use? What supplies do you already have? Or what will you need? These are things we're gonna talk about today along with what recipes you have and if they're safe. And that will be a, a really important part of what we talk about. The handouts, if you haven't printed them out, um, are kind of highlighted here to give you an idea. Many of them will be from the University of Minnesota. I also like to include a, out, an outline for you and you'll see this one doesn't have a lot of blue in it, quite a bit of blue, but um, you'll, you'll see what, as you print it that there's a lot of hyperlinks in there. A lot of them will take you to the University of Minnesota's how-to sheets and you can um, download those or print those, whatever it works for you. Um, in our graphic, I also have what is high and low pH for, for vegetables. You'll know what you can use a pressure canner for, what you should be using, um, uh, so what you should be using for pressure canner, what you can use for just um, a regular canner, and we'll talk about all of that. So what is the goal, I'm going to move this, for food preservation? Let me get to my screen on here. I've got two sheets. Um, well, produce, you know, contains a lot of water, and it will quickly perish due to mechanical damages and just due to natural enzymes of the, of the produce. So what we wanna do then is extend that shelf life and uh, by transforming it into a new food. And this will stop the spoilage and growth of microorganisms. So here we've got my buddy. Hi, my name is Fat Tom. I don't feel, don't worry, he's not insulted by that name. It just Help, helps him, helps me help you, um, and helps all of us remember what microbes need in order to, to thrive. So it's Fat Tom has his F-A-T-T-O-M, and that stands for, first of all, he needs the food, the nutrients from the produce, and then the A is for acidity. Anything below 4.5 is safe. Um, and that's what pr preserving does, helps bring that pH down. Um, it needs time for cooling. It needs that the cooling temperature between, and it's hidden by the, his feathers, how in the world, um, between 70 to 140 degrees. So those are the danger zones. That's what it needs to, um, to cool down. It needs approximately two hours of that cooling between those, those uh, temperatures. So what are the temperatures? Like I mentioned, it's 70 to 104 degrees. So if we're cooling it in the refrigerator after two hours, we're in good shape. We're heating it after two hours. It used to be two to four, but really two hours is all um, you dare leave it out. So get that stuff in the refrigerator or in the crock pot or oven, whatever you're gonna do. Um, besides the temperature then, those are the day that's the danger zone temperature danger zone tdz it needs oxygen so most of our um foods will be aerobic so it needs that 
oxygen, although botulism can grow in anaerobic um, conditions. And then finally, it needs moisture. Moisture is rated between one and or zero and one, and um, the danger zones are 9.5 to one. So those are where you wanna make sure that you have less moisture than that, if uh, unless it's in, uh, you know, frozen or canned or dehydrate, you wanna de dehydrate it, but below that 9.5. All right, I've gotta keep moving myself around here. So let's talk a little bit about where we can get uh, to where we're preserving food safely. One of the key things, I didn't mention this, but anything with a star on it, like you see up here. So on the handout page, it had a star in it. Anything with a star in it, those, uh, that information is included in, in your handouts. Um, some of the pages, I, I went through it a few times to make sure I had starred um, everything that I had included in the handout, but you do have a lot in the handout. So don't worry, um, those, those pages will be available. That information will be available to you. So where can you get some uh, tested and true recipes? The University of Minnesota online um, website, of course. Uh, complete, complete guide to home canning from the USDA uh, starting 2015 or later, as well as the So Easy to Preserve Ball Blue Book, past those dates, 1964, the sixth edition. And you wanna remember not to alter recipes, to consider your altitude. So if my niece Betsy is, <laughs> is joining us. Her altitude is going to be totally different than ours at a thousand feet here in southeastern Minnesota. You're going to want to use fresh disease-free uh, produce and you're going to want to make sure that you have cleanliness in mind. So wash your hands of course, wash your utensils, what you're going to be canning, freezing with, um, drying your food, and of course when you're sick, don't be doing your canning because that is also going to impact, of course, your outcome. So, Christine, do we have any questions so far? Food preservation or our Nothing speech? yet. Nothing yet. Okay. Well, folks, do throw those questions in the chat. I'm sorry we, can't, we don't have time in our presentation to turn our mics on, but please do let us know if you have any questions. So oh, let's get this out of the way again. Methods that I will be introducing today. I'll be talking about water bath canning and pressure canning. That'll include your jelly products, your pickles, um, fermenting. I'll just say, I do a lot of pickles. My grandson, I have nine grandkids, only one grandson. He said, he, his, my, my middle son cans and um, makes pickles and um, Miat, the daughter in that family, likes daddy's pickles, but Bjorn likes Ma Susie's pickles. So there you go. Uh, fermenting, sauerkraut. I have not done sauerkraut, but I do a lot of kimchi. I actually have a cottage industry for kimchi, so I do sell it and make a lot of kimchi. Uh, drying, I've done quite a bit of drying. I have a dehydrator. Actually, the two boys have a dehydrator. My daughter um, isn't interested at this point, busy being a mom and a nurse. Um, but the boys have dehydrators and I've done uh, fruit, meat, a lot of different things, herbs. And then I did a, a, I've done a lot of freezing. That was my mom. My, we had two huge chest freezers back home on the farm. So a lot of freezing. And we'll talk about all these methods today. So let's start with canning. Canning is a great way to preserve your summer produce, but it is one of the most time consuming methods. Um, and, but of course you can create a lot of tasty pro products with it. Uh, so we're gonna cover the basics of water bath canning, pressure canning, pickles, jellies, jams. And we, but we won't be talking about um, open kettle canning, inversion can oven canning, uh, oven canning, Instapots, those are, none of those are recommended as safe from the University of Minnesota or any, any university. So don't, don't, um, those are those, whether you've heard, hey, I can use my Instapot. Mm, no, don't, don't be doing that. Um, not, there hasn't been enough study um, and research done to make sure that that is going to be a safe um, way to, to preserve your, uh, what you, what you can. So let's take a look at boiling water canning. 
Um, this is the best for high acid food. So we have stars on all three of these or be more information and recipes. Uh, cucumbers, of course, are pickled with, with vinegar. So you get that, your high acidity there. High acid and acidified foods will be in a pH below 4.6. So you've got that with the tomatoes, with most of your apples. Microorganisms can't grow when you have a pH below that if your food is properly preserved. So we've got um, tomatoes. You can make your sauce, salsa, soup, um, or just canned tomatoes without using a pressure canner then. Um, anything that has acidity above 4.6, which is all on your handout um, and in resources and links, um, those will have to use a pressure canner. So this is, a, this is boiling water canning. Um, applesauce works, of course, pickles, anything with vinegar, we don't have to just pickle. Cucumbers, of course, string beans are real popular, uh, mixed vegetables, you can pickle all that. Um, pressure canning then on the, on the flip side is what you use for low acid foods. So that's your asparagus, unless you're pickling them, uh, carrots, peas, that type of thing. You'll want to use a pressure canner. Those, those higher temperatures you get with the pressure canner will give you that safety that you need. So that's where that comes in. Um, yeah, meats, um, there's all kinds of things and many and the handouts will have more all those things you need to use a pressure canner and I don't know it's not a lot of people that are canning meat but um, it is mentioned in there and there are um, there's information on how to do that so what do you what do you need when you're going to be either pressure canning or um, using a canner you'll need your lids here they are down here new lids for every every can you jar. So you're gonna have to re, uh, purchase those every time you, you jar. I keep mine for stuff I just stick in the fridge um, so that I, I'm not using plastic whenever I can. I, I do use my um, old lids and jars as I have so many. Um, last year was an issue folks. So this is nice that we're doing this early. Thank you 125 Live because as soon as you see some canning jars out there, you're gonna wanna grab those if you're planning to do some canning. Uh, of course, you'll need a pressure cooker if you're going to be doing some of those low, um, those, those low acid um, items. You're going to have uh, your canner. You're going to want a canning rack. Um, so the rack that goes in there, I don't have a picture of it, but it keeps it off the base of your canner. So um, you need jars, lids. I like the straight ones. I, this doesn't look like a good jar to me. I don't see cur or ball on it. Uh, those are the ones you're going to want to use as a true mason jar, not a mayonnaise jar. This looks like a mayonnaise jar. So this image I took off the internet might not be somebody who knew what they were doing when they took that picture. Um, these tools are really, um, some are important, some not so much. This is not as, as essential. Uh, that is a jar lifter too, but it doesn't do the work that this one does. This one, you can drop it right into the hot water bath. This one, you grab it around the neck. I don't think this one's to use to open the, the screw top because you don't screw it on that tight, on that tightly. Um, this is a nice piece. You use this when you've got this in the hot water, um, staying sterile. You just take the little magnet and tap it onto, and onto the, into the hot water and you can pick it up and set it on your jars. The funnel is super important. It keeps your rim of your jar clean and Otherwise, I'd be slopping all the way down the side. So I use this all the time um, when I make my kombucha. I use it when I'm, I've got two or three recipes I, I make regularly, uh, shrubs, and I use this all the time. This is to get the air bubbles off the sides inside your jar. And as you see, it's got the little little zigzaggies that help you measure, I think. It says, um, so this would be one inch. So this would be a half inch and that's how far you fill the jars. I'm not sure what this tool does. I don't have that and I don't need that. So your basic ones are the uh, lift jar lifter, funnel, something you can use a knife. And then just if you're good at guesstimating what an inch or half inch is, 
and I really like my magnet, but you can even make that a ladle and a clean towel, a cloth towel. I'm staying away from paper towels as much as I can. Oh no, my cat is coming on my desk. Go away, Luna. Okay, sorry. All right, so how does canning preserve your food? So food is placed in a jar according to the recipe and the air bubbles are removed. So that's right here. So here at, um, salt is added afterwards in this process. That's not always how it is, depending on your recipe again. Uh, remove the air bubbles along the side. You, and this is um, called raw packing here. So this would probably have just water poured in, hot boiling water uh, poured in. And then you um, might need to add a little bit more, not much head space on this one, it looks to me. Uh, you wanna wipe that upper rim. So that's where that clean cloth comes in. And then you're gonna put on your, your clean, your sterilized. This has been sterilized ahead of time again, the jar. And I'll talk about that in a second. And you put on your, your lid, metal lid, and then your screw top and it's ready to go in the hot water bath or in the can and the pressure cooker. So using the pressure cooker, let's start with that. You're gonna put two to three inches of hot water in the canner. You're gonna place the filled closed jars on the rack using the jar lifter. You're gonna fasten that canner lid securely and leave the vents in the pet cot open. So everyone's, every pressure cooker is going to be a little different. They've got some that are combined uh, with the um, temperature, uh, the pressure gauge. And um, so just have to follow the directions. So these are just general directions on your pressure canner. Uh, maintain the high, the high heat and exhaust steam for 10 minutes. And then you're going to close that petcock or place the weight on the vent. So I, this might be the petcock. I always, my mom always had one with a vent and then she would just put the weight on it. So um, depending on what you have, then begin timing the, um, the process according to the recipe. And when that timing is complete, you turn off the heat, remove the canner from the heat source with your hot pads and allow the canner to depressurize, super important. You don't want to force the cooling of the can can canner. This could result in liquid boiling out of the jars and the seal fails, fails then at that time, point. Uh, when the pressure is at zero, you open the petcock, remove or remove the weight and allow the canner to sit for another 10 minutes before unfastening and removing the lid. As you remove the lid, just like when you're pouring the hot water off your boiled potatoes, you want to make sure that steam goes away from you. Use your jar lifter and lift those jars out nice and straight with the jar lifter, set them on um, dry towels, or I usually use a wooden cutting board and make sure they don't touch. And then just let them sit there and cool 12 to 24 hours. You're gonna hear that wonderful ping. Make sure you know how many jars you are and count those pings. And if you happen to go outside or, or aren't around for, for all that. You should hear them pretty soon though. It takes 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes you generally, but sometimes a little longer to hear that lovely ping. And uh, then you go back and test it. And to test it, you just touch the top. If it pops, you know, you didn't get a seal. So if it's kind of like a trampoline, no, that's not, a, I mean, you'd have to be really small to have that be a trampoline. Oh, um, if, it's, if it's like a, one of those pop toys where you pop, 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 back and forth. Yeah, it's not sealed. If it stays, if it's down and stays down, you've got a seal. And then the jar, uh, the bands can be removed. Now, why do you remove the band? It's a safety thing. You know, if you've got, if you've got a, in, in, in your cool, dark place, which is, we'll talk about in a second, where you store these, um, and it starts oozing out the side, you really don't have a good seal. And that lid um, isn't really going to impact that much, but you can get a better idea if the lid comes off easily, uh, you can have a seal. So the, the band at that point is not necessary and it's best to take it off. All right, we're almost ready for questions. I hope if you've got some, you've thrown them in there. We just got a couple more slides before we take some questions, but hey, we need to know how to sterilize our jar, jars and lids. This is important. Um, you're gonna cover your jars in that canner so one or two, you know, if, if, you got, if you're using a hot pre, uh, a pressure canner, 
uh, you really need another canner there as well um, that will cover cover your jars um, uh, one inch over. And I cover with those with hot water. So I wash them first in the dishwasher and then I put them in the canner um, and cover them with over one inch. And then I boil that for at least 10 minutes. Turn off heat and it can be left in the water for, over, for an hour. And then you're gonna remove the lids. So you see that you've put them in so that the rim is up. So they're filled with the water as it boils. If you have it upside down, my mom always did it that way in a in a in a cake pan. She'd put a cake pan on the on the stove and she'd put water in there. That water would get sucked up into the jars, and you have to tip them every once in a while. Um, that's not that's not the recommended way to do it. You want to cover them one inch, like you see here. Remove them with the tongs. Drain them well. I drain it back into this, so you don't have to drain it back into that if you're just doing those five usually five jars fit in there if they're quart size and set aside. And the reason you don't need to pour it back in there, the hot water is because your lids will go in there um, as well. And um, I think that might be the next slide, nope. So your lids will go in there and I maybe um, have that. Oh, all right, so I, I don't have a picture of it, but it's in the, the lids, you're gonna have the lids hot and the rings um, and, and you don't wanna boil them, you're, that could, uh, damage the rubber in that in that ring. So you want to just put them in the hot water, um, simmering, and let them sit there for 10 minutes. And it can sit in there while you're waiting. And that's where that great little magnetic thing, um, unfortunately made with plastic, but um, really works well to, to dip in there and to pick up one ring at a time, pop it on top of your on top of your jar that's all ready to go into the canner. I could stop a sec. Christian, do we have questions on any of this? I don't have my little question mark thing here, but um, that's a lot of information. Yeah, there's a few. Okay. Uh, someone would like to know where you sell your kimchi. <laughs> I, I sell it from my house. So um, I'll be starting some maybe in the next while, but yeah. Um, so yeah, they can just ask for contact information if they're interested. Um, and then other than jellies, is there any reason not to pressure can everything? Other than jellies, is there a reason not? So I wonder what they had in mind. Um, you just wanna make sure using the proper process um, if, so if you're freezing, you don't, you know, you don't, you can put it in a jar. You can freeze and make mason jars, only straight-sided ones. Um, but uh, so the pressure, any, is there a reason not to pressure? So you're overcooking your your um, your uh, your little your pickles. I wouldn't do pickles in a pressure canner. Uh, you can do everything else in the pressure canner, yeah, because you're not going to hurt your tomatoes. Um, let's see, apples, you can, yeah, pressure canning apples is fine. Pickles you want crisp. So that's the only reason not to do pickles. So I guess I finally got around to, what is she, or she or he really asking? And, and if I didn't answer it, please throw in another chat comment, folks. Anything else? That's all we got. All righty, very good questions. All right. Then there's canning methods of hot or raw packing. So we've got your, your jelly, it looks like a ras raspberry jelly on the jam on the, on the left. I like the metal. I used to have a metal one of this. It, it was so dinged up. My husband uses it to feed, fill the bird feeders because it just got all bent up. But I used to have a metal one from my mama back in the day, uh, the funnel. Um, so the hot packing is vegetables are, are raw packing vegetables aren't heated they're just put in the jars um, here we've got them cut into short pieces for the string beans um, if you're going to pickle them of course it's nice to have them long and uh, you know I wouldn't even buy uh, anything but wide mouth jars then I always know when I go to the store I need to buy wide mouth lids but also it just makes it easy to get the food out of the jars and, and if you're packing pickles you want that long, nice pickle in there, it's easier to pack too. So if you can get your hands on them, 
Menards High V, they get them in pretty early, um, especially Menards here in southeastern Minnesota. I know Betsy, if you're listening, you, can, you don't have a Menards out there, I've been told. Um, but those kind of stores are great for picking up your, your canning jars. Also, you know, if they're not shipped, I will go to Savers and look, but oftentimes they're more expensive at a Savers. Um, they'll charge like a dollar a, a jar and you can get them cheaper than that at, at your stores if you're watching. Okay, so back to the, the raw pack. You're gonna add, um, vegetables aren't heated, they're just washed and trimmed and put in your jars, uh, pack tightly. Uh, vegetables will, sh will shrink, um, except for corn, lima beans, potatoes, peas, those should be packed loosely. And your instructions, you always wanna watch your recipe. Don't just go, I know how to do this. Um, have a recipe in front of you so you know, uh, but those will um, not expand, those, those will expand and you'll end up with your lids popping or not sealing right it's, is what's gonna happen. Then um, your jar is filled with boiling water. So, and salt is optional. It's a flavor option. So you don't have to add salt. That's where you saw that scoop of salt going in uh, to those jars in that, in that diagram. And then, um, so it's recommended about a half a teaspoon uh, per pint and a teaspoon per quart if you do salt them. Then you're gonna close your jars. You're gonna take that knife or that thin spatula kind of uh, measuring thing and you need to get the air bubbles out if you need to. It's It should be, oh, here it says non-metallic spatula. Um, I've not known that and I didn't pay attention to that. So that's good to know. Um, I just use my, my plastic one and that'll free the bubbles. It's called a bubble freer. There you go. It allows the air to escape. And then you might have to add a little bit more liquid to get to that a recommended amount of headspace for your vegetables, whether there's the sh shrinking ones like the um, string beans here or corn, which will expand. Um, wipe the rim always with a clean damp cloth to remove any particles. And then place the sterile lids on the jars, adjusting the metal ring band fingertip tight. So don't over tighten that. You don't wanna start impacting or creating your own seal because that's not how it works. You need that air to go out. Um, the boiling will force all that air out and provide, you know, remember oxygen is one of the fat Tom letters that we need to get rid of that oxygen. For hot packed, the food is prepared and heated before being placed in the jar. So your jams and jellies will be one of those where you're going to heat that, make that gel uh, up in your pan and you're going to um, then um, put that in the pressure canner to seal that thing. Of course, if you're freezing it, then that's not necessary. Um, tomato sauce, salsa, that's another thing. You're gonna, you know, those will heat up. You're gonna cook that, um, get that combination of all those good jalapeno peppers and onions and garlic. And I put pineapple in mine, um, all that in there. And then you're gonna hot pressure can that. A raw pack, um, hot pack, both are great options. I typically, uh, I do both, I do both because I do my pickles raw packed and then uh, my salsa, I freeze that. Um, so that's where the pineapple is. You're not gonna find a recipe of you from the U of M out there. So I do freeze my salsa um, just to make sure it's um, good. But, you know, I should send my recipe up to them and say, hey, any reason I can't, can't um, hot pack these or, or pressure can that this. Okay, so we talked about headspace. Uh, maintaining that, that proper head, headspace is important. Um, it's that empty space that's between the um, jar, or the, the lid and the food. Okay, so usually it's one inch, um, but that one inch. Um, to a half inch. Those are the general proportions for that. Here's water bath canning. Talked about that. Just gives you that head, half inch for tomatoes. So this is on tomatoes. So this is the water bath, not the pressure canning. And how long to do it. Tomatoes, no added liquid. All this information, I don't see. I don't see my star, but this all should be, yep, this is all in your handouts or a link in your handouts. 
Um, so pint jars, quart jars, all gives you information on that. And then there's pressure canning depending on altitude for all of this. You'll have that information. So pay attention to that in your area. And the best resource for that, if you're not from this um, altitude, um, is your extension office, um, extend, extension website. So back in the day, I know my mom called the extension a lot. Um, we, her best friend was a master gardener. And so she called Janice a lot. Um, but uh, now we can go on the website and just check it out and make sure that we're doing it in the safest possible way. So too little headspace. You're going to have food, bu food bubbling out of the jar during process and you won't get a proper seal. Too little, head, too much headspace. You're gonna get discolored food and it's gonna prevent the jar from possibly sealing as well. So it's not just a random number. It is uh, something recommended from the university extension offices and do pay attention to that. Storing, and I think then we're again at question time. Um, cool, dry place and consume within a year. And here, oh no, the bands are on this pretty picture. Um, but yeah, take the take the bands off. I'm glad it's, well, I'm not glad it's on there because then I would have remembered either way to mention, take the bands off. You don't need to have them on there. String them on, open up, a, a, <laughs> open up in your, in your laundry room, uh, Moyer clothes hanger. So it's a big hook and then thread them on there and then take them up and hook them on your handles when you're canning. I don't know, it's kind of, kind of a crazy thing, but hey, you know, then you know where they are. If you've got the space for that, they're not the easiest thing to store in other words. All right, water canning, pressure canning, storage. Christine, you're on. Uh, someone was wondering about why space is important, but I think that you you maybe did cover that. Yep. Great, I'm glad I got, I'm glad I added that slide. It was one of my later ones I added. Any other questions? Uh, so someone just said, uh, so we don't store with the bands on. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I have. Um, so when I took this um, advanced consultant class, I thought, oh, is it that big a deal? But I do remember, and my mama's, ugh, my mom's place to store her canning was on the table that is now in my garage. And it's like, um, I don't know, 50. 20 feet, I don't know, it's super long. And it was the canning table and I wanted it so bad. I guess I was really into canning back when I was in my twenties. I know I, I know I did some back as soon as I was married, I was married about 22. So 20, you yeah, know, anyway, before 21 too. And um, I wanted that table when we first bought our house and I knew the old house was getting destroyed and uh, they pulled that out of the basement and I got it up here in Rochester, some miracle of a way. And it was it was really damp. I mean, we would get in the spring, we would get two inches, three inches of water. And we played down there. I bet I got all kinds of molds and stuff. <laughs> but what I'm saying is she kept the she kept the rings on, but I do remember some oozing coming out of some of those jars, especially the string beans. And um, this is just a sure way that you're gonna know, I'm not feeding this one to my family. It's going in the garbage and the compost. It's going in the compost. Let me say it again, it's going in the compost. That's another presentation. Actually, um, Christine did did my um, gardening in small spaces uh, video get posted on on this um, link. This is a good time to mention that. Talk a lot about composting. If you've got a smaller property like I do, comp or live in an apartment, um, you can can and you know you buy stuff at the farmers market or find a farmer to buy your tomatoes from. Um, but compost that, the scraps that you get, it's so good for our environment, good for your garden, good for, um, you know, good way to utilize those scraps. So um, yeah, the, that, that way you're gonna know, take the bands off and if it's bad, you'll know right away. Anything else? Nope, that's it for now. All right, let's go on to our next 
Oh, jams and jellies. My mama made a lot of jams and jellies. We lived next to Wold Strawberry Farm down in Mabel, Minnesota. And I worked for them. We picked strawberries for them. I babysat for them. And we made a lot of strawberry jam. And we made a lot of raspberry jam. And um, it can be canned, refrigerated, frozen to stop spoilage. So I typically freeze mine because then I don't have to hot water process it. I can um, get that in the freezer right away. You can, you can do jams, jellies, fruit butters, preserves, uh, conserves, marmalades, fruit spreads. And um, the one great thing about jams and jellies, if you do have one that you don't get quite as thick as you want, it could also be a dessert topping. So what do you need for jams and jellies? Well, you need fruit, pectin, acid, and sugar maybe low sugar or no sugar. And there, that's where the pectin comes in. There are pectins out there that will allow you to do the lower sugar or no sugar ones. Um, the fruit, of course, is first of all. And the fruit is what gives the preserve its flavor. You wanna choose ripe, fresh ripe fruit that's disease free, although you can use frozen uh, fruit as well. Follow the directions and precautions. Um, and that's the key through all this is follow the recipe. And um, that's going to help you make sure you have a safe outcome and a successful outcome. So you need your fruit. There's strawberry featured here. You've got uh, grapes. I don't have, I don't grow with raspberries. Um, I don't have the room for it. But um, yeah, whatever you might have. Next is our pectin. We've got a liquid form, sure gel. Here's a powdered apple pectin. Uh, pectin is responsible for the gel in preserving. So some fruits have higher pectin than others. Apples, cranberries don't need pectin for the most part. Um, some apples, there are a couple varieties of apples that will. Low pectin will be uh, strawberries, peaches, raspberries, rhubarb, um, sweet cherries, pears, figs, and under uh, ripened fruit has a little higher pectin. But you wanna use your fruit where it's, where it's uh, ripe. Okay, so that's pectin. Then in order to do your jams and jellies, you need acid, acid, is needed for the gel formation as well. It provides flavor. Need a little higher amount for under ripened as well with this. And lemon juice or citric, citrus acid will, will help increase that. So there we've got a lemon getting squeezed. Again, do not alter your recipe. And then finally, we need sugar. Sugar adds flavor. It also helps preserve the pro product. And it is um, part of that gelling formation as well. Sugar will help inhibit bacterial growth and it's re the uh, user required amount. Most will call for half a cup per cup of fruit to get that proper gel. Generally, it's white granulated sugar, uh, brown sugar, other sweeteners. Um, there are recipes out there for that as well. For low or no sugar, it's um, the pectin, the gelling agent that you'll um, have to look for to get a, a low sugar or no sugar product. Let's move this. So what's needed? You're going to want a large flat bottom uh, pot or saucepan. Um, you want the, a jelly bag or cloth. If you're going to make jelly, of course, it'll clear out those seeds, little, little fruit pieces. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the right temperature, so you'll need a candy thermometer and a ladle. Um, and then half pints or pint mason jars or your freezer containers. Again, you can freeze in your jars. And I'll show you where that freezer line is um, when we get to the freezer section. Uh, back in the day, my mama used paraffin to seal, your, seal the the jams and jellies, and that is not a safe way to go. Mold can grow underneath the paraffin and alongside the jars. So do not go back to grandma's recipe and think that's safe because it is not. All right, any questions on jams and jellies? That was a quick one.
Uh, someone was asking about the easiest way to freeze fruit, but it sounds like you're maybe going to get there. You betcha. Later. All righty. If you have any other questions, throw them in there, folks. All right. Vinegar pickles. I should have moved this one up a little bit, but the U of M had this at this point. Um, hey, one thing we didn't talk about is lab labeling. Um, I would do more than just dill pickles. I would say which recipe it is of my dill pickles, if it's my spicy one or whatever, and then date it. You want to make sure to do that. Okay. Pickling is a great way to preserve cucumbers, onions, beans. I mean, string beans, uh, ca uh, carrots, cauliflower. Um, I've got a, like I said, my grand grandson, my only, my only grandson really likes, oh, and my uh, two, three or four, oh, five-year-olds, two by two five-year grand one, um, their cousins, they love my pickles and want them for their birthday. Um, acidity is a key for pickling. It's usually a one-to-one -one, uh, water to vinegar brine ratio. I have not found that to be the case in a lot of recipes though. Um, so again, as you see on here, don't alter your recipe, follow the recipe. And heat processing, of course, is the safest. Um, my mama didn't always um, heat process hers, but let's stay safe. Um, there's flavor changes. You know, you can go sweet, sour, more sour, um, more little um, spicy. And that increased acidity stops the, the uh, microorganisms and foodborne illnesses. So tips for your best cucumber pickles. This is like, this. I've been working on this for years to get the best, I love pickles, the best pickles. So I learned a lot with my course and I'm sharing it with you. Oh, I'm missing an M in cucumber. I thought I fixed that. Good gravy. Christine, make sure I change that. Don't let me do that this evening when I do my six o'clock. Okay. Choose pickling cucumbers. Did not realize how important this is. They have a thinner skin. Pickle soon after harvesting. If you can't get enough in one harvest, um, wrap each cucumber individually in paper tunneling and place them in a sealed container, Ziploc bag, something like that, and they can store longer for you. So that's a trick that I'm gonna implement this year. Um, another trick that I learned in this, and I did not, did not know, um, and actually did all year this year, was remove 1 16th of the blossom end. So there's the blossom end here. Uh, this is the, this comes from the stem. This is the blossom end, move a 16th of an inch and that has an enzyme down there at that tip that will make them go soft on you. Uh, use softer distilled water. I, I don't have that problem uh, where my water is so hard that it Im impacts that. So play with that a little bit. If you wanna use your soft water or you um, wanna buy distilled water, you will have a better result of having a firmer, um, uh, or excuse me, having less cloudiness in your brine. I, my brine is, crystal clear from my water here in Rochester. So it's not a real hard water. Um, use cider or white vinegar. Always use canning or pickling salt. It's not gonna have any of those additives on um, keeping the clumping part of it. And that impacts your, your um, quality of your pickle as well. Um, use granulated sugar. I use um, cane sugar um, and don't, alter the amount of salt. Pre-soaking is something I have never done. I have never done that. Um, but I'm so excited about it this year. Um, so you take a layer of ice, get a big bag of ice, ice, pickle, ice, pickle, ice, pickle, and add water to it. Let it set. Um, the recipe will tell you, I think it's up to 12 hours. And that will really crisp up your pickle. So I love crisp pickles. Um, this year I had really crisp pickles. And it wasn't from my mama's recipe with the alum or lime. Don't use, don't use that. Um, it was with a grape leaf. And the U of M does not say don't use a grape leaf because of course we can eat grape leaves, but they have an enzyme in there 
as well that will keep your pickles firm and crispy. So I did not suck do the, do the water soak um, with my pickles this year. I'm gonna do that this year. I'm gonna probably experiment because I have lots of beautiful grapes and grape leaves in my backyard. Um, but that is what's recommended is soaking them in icy water and that will give you a nice crisp pickle. So you heard it here, folks. All right, questions about the very lovely and wonderful pickle. We have a question about the recommended way to clean the jelly bags after. Um, I, I would uh, just hand wash them really good. Soapy, soapy hand wash um, and then hang them to dry. Um, that's what I do with my, my Lefsa um, cloths. I do some cheesecloth thing. What's the last time I did a cheesecloth thing? But yeah, that's, that's what I do um, with that. Anything else? Hey, with the, with the pickle, I, I use a vegetable brush on the outside of my pickles to get all those little nubbies off, those little pokey owey things. Um, and some of the recipes will recommend leaving a little bit of the stem that wasn't a part of any of the pictures that any of the stem was left, but that was um, in there some. I haven't researched, I'll, I'll research that for tonight's presentation is leaving any of the stem on the pickle, what the, what the deal is. But do get to slice off just a sixteenth of an inch off the blossom end. No other questions? All right, fermenting. Kimchi time, folks. I don't do sauerkraut. I am a I am German, a quarter German, but I don't do sauerkraut. My mama was a good trooper. She married into a very Scandinavian family. First Norwegian settlement in Minnesota is down in Spring Grove, if you did not know. That's a trivia answer for you. Where's the first Norwegian settlement? Minnesota is Spring Grove, Minnesota. And we, I could sing for you right now, but I don't have time. The Norwegian national anthem, we made a lot of Norwegian things. And so the German part of mom, she, she left that back in the cross and, um, and she did the left side. So we didn't do any sauerkraut, um, but fermentation is the careful curing um, of produce. No vinegar is needed to create the brine. Uh, bacteria creates a safe acidic product um, and it stops the spoilage of disease causing microorganisms, changes the flavor of food. Fermentation is a safe and delicious way to enjoy produce. So let's find out a little bit more. Okay, you can ferment a lot of things. Um, here we've got our, our cucumbers again, uh, cabbage, of course. Um, I don't use this cabbage for my kimchi, but um, within that I add carrots in my kimchi, onions, garlic. I make a chive kimchi. Uh, I, I make kimchi out of the invasive species garlic mustard. Oh my goodness, it's so delicious. Um, so it's a great way to get rid of that horrible uh, invasive species that's impacting our soil. That's a whole nother presentation. Garlic mustard, eradicate it, pull it out under that little hook, strip the leaves off, and you can eat that in a wonderful um, kimchi. You're going to want to use, uh, you can ferment kombucha. I have some uh, working right now creating that sobe. Um, carrots, like I said, um, broccoli, I do bro I do a broccoli kimchi. That's uh, actually, that's a, more of a fresh one. I, I've, I've done that in fermented too. Okay, so uh, fermentation encourages that good, good growth of bacteria. It produces an acid and that acid stops spoilage and bad market microorganisms um, to take place. So how do, you, how do you do it? Salt is essential. Also being airtight is essential. Salt, too much salt um, keeps the, the good bacteria from growing and too little salt will encourage spoilage. And the thing is with the kimchi, um, I have not found a university of, um, recipe for that. Um, I, my daughter's Korean. I learned from a Korean woman that Korean woman's daughter married my son years later, of course, and they have five daughters. So there's a lot of um, Korean 
stuff going on um, in our family and I learned from her. So, um, so my recipe isn't something that I share because it's not a university-based recipe, but it, it is, um, it does ferment very nicely. You wanna pack your pro products. So here we've got the, this is gonna be a sauerkraut I'm guessing with carrots and the cabbage in there. You wanna pack it tightly and make sure it's under the brine. You wanna remove the air pockets and the fermentation um, takes place at that 70 to 75 um, degrees. Um, higher temperatures will cause spoilage. Lower temperatures will slow down the curing time. And that's what I do with my kimchi because I don't want it to get too sour. For most people, it gets too bubbly. Um, so I refrigerate everything I make to slow that down. Um, so if you want less of a tartness to your, your, uh, your sauerkraut, that's what you would do. And it also stabilizes, um, heat processing or refrigeration will stabilize the, the product so it doesn't continue to ferment. So, you, so heat processing, so processing uh, probably not in um, your pressure canner, but just in your canner uh, would stop that and then make sure it seals tight or um, if you're storing in the fridge, then that's fine too. Okay, questions about fermentation. Getting close to freezing, I believe is next. There's not, go ahead. What's up? Nothing right now. Okay, very good. Oh yes, we can't forget about drying. Drying is a great way to preserve your food. Uh, the water is removed, of course, through drying to prevent spoilage. You get a hard outer layer that acts as a barrier to harmful microorganisms. Drying extends the shelf life, of course, and slows down the natural enzymes. And again, I've dried a lot of things last year. I, I did more than most, um, and I dry all my herbs and love using my dried herbs. Bless, ugh, best low moisture foods are, um, are the best to use. So the low moisture foods like apples, tomatoes are kind of high moisture, but they dry well herbs. Um, lettuce, of course, is a really high moisture food. Melons, cucumbers, they don't, you don't want to put them in, in your dehydrator. That's not going to be um, a good, good food to dehydrate. So what do you need? Um, you need heat low humidity and air circulation. You can get that from, um, from just putting it out in the sun and air drying, but Minnesota gets pretty high in humidity. Um, so it's not the easiest way or the best way. Um, you can have, you really have to spread out your things, your, your, um, your pieces of food um, to dry them just by air drying. A dehydrator is great. Um, I've bought one new one and two that I found at like Savers or Goodwill that have been great. Just clean them up good and they are, they work great. Dehydrated will take generally six to eight hours depending on your food. Um, and it's the easiest to control the heat and the air circulation and get that humidity down. Ovens, um, generally about 140 degrees. And uh, if you can get some airflow, it, that's, that's what's hard there. I do it on top of my stove too. I just lift it off the, um, I've got a little mini burner that's for keeping food, a warmer, a warmer thing. And then I just kind of use a cookie rack to put my cookie sheet up over that with the parchment paper. And that I get more air circulation on top of the stove. And um, then quickly, once that's dry, then I crumble it up and put it in my jars for my herbs. Um, the oven will take twice as long, of course, than the dehydrator. For success, you want to pre-treat your food. Um, honey, um, before dehydrating, serves both to preserve the fruit by increasing the sugar concentration and also adds that nice sugary kick. Um, but you can also dip it in uh, absorbic acid, citrus. <laughs> I got two F's for fruit, Christine. Don't let me do that for later. Hmm. Anyway, um, for vegetables to stop the enzymes, blanching them is, is recommended. So when um, your, your fruit is dry, the, the fruit will be leathery and bend but not break. 
your vegetables should snap. They should break along with your herbs. And then you'll know it's brittle and crumbles easily and is, is ready to dehydrate. When you're done um, dehydrating your food, you want to store them in an airtight container. Um, but initially, watch for about a week to see if any condensation forms on the inside of your jar. So just really keep a close eye on that. If you get some condensation in there, you know it's not dry enough and you need to put it back on the dryer to dry it enough so it's, it's going to stay good and dry and not spoil. So that was it for drying and dehydrating. Great recipes out there through the U of M. I've got a couple good um, cookbooks. I've given my sons cookbooks um, for Father's Day. So they've got great recipes. Any questions on drying? Ooh, we're over time a little bit. Sorry if some people left, this is being recorded. Um, so if you need to leave, I understand, but we did get, uh, didn't get too much of a late start, but I do have freezing left. And if there's no questions, we'll keep going. Freezing, mm. low cost way to preserve fruits and vegetables if you have a freezer. Oh, that tomato wasn't frozen, was it? Nope, the string beans are. Um, it's the easiest method to use and least time consuming. You've got the highest quality of flavor, texture, and nutritional value. So it's a great way to do it. If you've got a freezer, um, labeling, keeping a record on the outside of your freezer, what's in there is what I recommend so you don't get things lost in the bottom. Oh, I still have one more bag of string beans. I know what's in here. Um, you can find that. So that's a good way to, to do that. Um, it controls the enzyme breakdown and um, blanching is re recommended for your, um, for your vegetables. Here you see uh, it's, it's, it's cooking, but then you drop it. Once you've strained it out of there, you put it in ice to stop that, that breakdown of the enzymes. For fruit, you want to pre-treat uh, for best flavor. Um, so sugar, you can, and you can do a sugar pack or a syrup pack as well. You'll treat it with uh, absorbic acid, will help preserve the color and flavor. And so sugar isn't necessary, but it is a, um, something that you can add. It's not gonna be a problem. You freeze, what I like to do is freeze on a tray or in a measured amount per container. So I know I have two cups of something, one cup of something. Um, and if you freeze it on a tray and all separated, and then once it's frozen, you put it in your container, um, then you know that you've, you can take out, you know, six strawberries to add or whatever your, you know, a handful of string beans that you need for a, a meal or for uh, dinner. Allow for that headspace when liquid is present, present again, whether it's your plastic uh, freezer containers, you want to use what's recommended, or you want to, um, and here we are with containers and we're almost done folks. I'm sorry again that it's a little past what I would like it to be. Um, you want it to be moisture and vapor resistant uh, re to reduce that freezer burn option, durable, leak proof, um, easy to seal. Of course, you've got your freezer bags that are so popular, but you can use your jars. This is the free, this is the line here for freezing, just right there to give you the headspace you need for expansion of liquids. Um, uh, there are some earth friendly options that I put on uh, the handout again. And um, yeah, the freezing is a great way to do it. We've got a huge freezer and I've been doing a lot of that. So for high quality foods, keep your um, freezer at zero degrees. Uh, when you do it that fast, so I've got it spread out on that tray, they're gonna freeze. These were all raspberries were all frozen individually. You're gonna have the smaller ice crystals and that will keep your fruit the best. It can be um, when you freeze it slower, you get the larger ice crystals and that will tear your, your those little membranes in the, in the fruit will um, tear and, and not be as uh, good texture and flavor. Um, don't overload your freezer when you're freezing things. Just uh, do it in, in different time frames so that you're not cool it, warming down that freezer. You want to keep it as cold as possible and then add your next batch of things you want to freeze. Okay, think about what option is best for you. There's lots of different options out there, folks. We're going to open it up shortly. If anyone has any questions and wants to stay a little longer, um, canning or preserving, there's all kinds of options. Any more questions? We'll take those. And I'm going a little faster now because I, I want to be respectful to your time. 
Um, but if you do have a second, if you could let us know um, if this information was helpful or if um, there's anything else that we could have provided. So I have A, B, C, D, E, F for A through D. If you could answer um, this information provided uh, was clearly presented, A1 uh, is not really A2 somewhat, A3 would be definitely. Um, answer B is additional resources from the university uh, extension was provided for continued growth. B1, not really, two, somewhat, three, definitely. Um, whoops. <laughs> Answer C is I enjoyed this presentation. Uh, C1, not really, um, and would encourage others to attend. C2 or C3. Answer D, I learned about Olmsted County Extension Master Gardener and would like to uh, learn more. Actually, I've got a couple slides. I'm going to move this one a little later to the presentation. Um, you can send us a phone number if you want to learn more about the Master Gardener program, um, although your handout will have all that too. And E, is there a topic that would you would like a Master Gardener to present? Um, and finally, do you have ideas how we can reach out to all corners of our community, our county? So with that, I'm going to let you know what presentations are coming up through the Master Gardener program, both at 125 Live and throughout our community. Uh, April 3rd, Kelly Ray and I think Diane Sneavy will be doing um, produce for beginners in Byron Community Ed. So check out the Byron Community Ed website or the Master Gardener page. If you're not a member of the Master Gardener website page, uh, you can go to the U of M extension, uh, Olmsted County extension. That link is on there. We'd love to have you join our Facebook page. April 20th, Tom Bellinger will be talking about pollinators and rain gardens. Kelly Ray is going to be back at 125 Live here with you on May 13th, talking about clean water. I have a presentation ready to go on the benefits and how to of house plants, and that is to be determined. Um, and Whoops, we're past the state. That's the one Kelly Ray in, um, is doing on April 3rd. Um, grow your own produce for beginners. Sorry, oh, I've got to fix that page. Ah. Anyway, thanks for joining me. I'm a master gardener for Olmsted County. And um, we've been a busy, this, this is 2019. We did tons of educational events throughout the state, community gardens. We've produced, given a lot of food. We do rain gardens, pollinators, school gardens. So uh, we're a busy group and would love to have more Master Gardeners join us. If you're interested, this is part of your handout. And um, this is a picture of some of us. And this is all part of your uh, handout as well. So Christine, you want to open up our, um, anybody else out there want to make some comments? Um, any other questions, Christine, first of all? Uh, you you meant for people to answer your the survey in the chat box, right? Absolutely. Do I need to go back to that? Maybe I will. And how can I get everybody's face up there? I don't know how many people are left with me. Participant thirteen left. Any other questions? If you want to unmute yourself, you can do that at this time. Any comments? There we go. Stop sharing. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I hope you got something from this, and I hope that you are um, going to take advantage of some of that great produce. I'm expecting and planning for a great growing season and super excited. I ordered a uh, hundred strawberry bare roots for my towers for Father's Day. I'm making these pyramid towers with a pipe down the middle, drill holes in that, the PVC pipe, and I'll fill that part way. Put, I'll put a mesh on the inside of this wooden frame I, I made and um, then poke holes. So we'll do a layer of strawberries, more dirt layer of strawberries. And I'm super excited to see how much, how many strawberries. And it's gonna go on the end of my, right by my sidewalk. It's a sharing thing. So kids walking by, hopefully get excited about gardening and produce and can 
pick what they want and we'll have conversations, distanced conversations uh, with those. And, and, you know, I have Candyland painted on my driveway too. So between eating the strawberries and playing Candyland, hopefully we get kids and people excited about our great environment, our great earth. So anyway, a little bit about my nonsense and thanks again. Tell friends if they want to learn about canning tonight, we're back on at six. Thank you, Audrey. I see you waving. And Missy, I see you still got 10 more people. I don't see anybody else. Why don't I see anybody?